Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hey, welcome to our session. Um, <clears throat> look at this, we've got the big room. Excellent. A um, couple of housekeeping things. Make sure you've got some feedback forms in front of you. If you haven't, go and see the lovely lady over there, who I can't remember the name of. That's terrible. What's your name? China? Yeah. Lovely. There you go. Um, <clears throat> uh, Ment. Where are you, Ment? There we are. Ment came up to me uh, just before, and he says he's got a plane to catch or something, and he's going to leave halfway through. So when he's running away, yeah, it's not because he, he, he hates us. He just wanted everybody to know that. So <laughs> if, if, I, if I leave halfway through, it's not because I hate <laughs> <laughs> um, So yes, PVS, MCS, uh, Excalibur. Good. Where's Stuart? Stuart's in the room. Stuart. Uh, the reason I'm picking Stuart out is he works for Citrix and he's taking over provisioning. Ooh. So, so this essentially is all his fault. <laughs> it's fixed now, isn't it? It's all fixed now. It's okay. yeah, yeah, fine. Um, <clears throat> if I accidentally say the name that's not Excalibur, that's going to be you know maybe announced soon. I never did it, right? Because I'm not allowed to say that thing. Yeah, you can put your fingers in your ears. Not me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's that's housekeeping over with. So um, uh, my name is Jim Moyle. Um, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Jim Moyle. Uh, unlike in my last session yesterday, where I misspelled my own Twitter name, you can find me at jimmoyle.com. Um, I'm a CTP and have been for uh, about a year or so. Uh, I think everybody here is a CTP, aren't they? I don't know, I'm giving away CTPs with... with no, that's, that's, v, that's, <laughs> that's V expert. That's, that's V expert, sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I work for Atlantic Computing, um, so hence the reason I'm a bit of an IOPS nerd. Uh, I was going to say you could uh, come and chat to me at the booth, but all the booths have gone. Uh, so you can't do that. But, um, but if you want to chat about Atlantis stuff, then uh, I'll be around. Um. So, uh, yeah, my name is Aaron Parker. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at StealthPuppy and blogging at StealthPuppy.com. I've been blogging now for almost seven years, would you believe? The story of why he calls himself StealthPuppy is not as interesting as you might think. <laughs> <laughs> and we can talk about that later. <laughs> uh, so I, too, am a CTP. Um, very fortunate, I think, that I can say that. I'm always uh, thinking that somebody's going to come along and take that away from me. We'll find out next week. Uh, and I work for Kelway. So I'm an end user computing uh, solutions architect at Kelway, office uh, just down the road. Uh, and uh, I am not a storage guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a storage session either, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, but it kind of is, but it's about deployment sort of stuff. But I am uh, I'm an old school, I hate that term, uh, Xenope guy. So back in the day, we were doing uh, just standard tin with a couple of drives in it. That's all you needed at the time, two drives, RAID 1, maybe RAID 5. If we got lucky, we had some more, some more drives. But never had to think about storage. Uh, deployment, well, that was always an interesting one. Typically, it might have been next, next, finish, or most horribly, pulling one drive out, sticking another drive, letting that mirror finish, and then putting the drive back and stick another drive in and let that mirror finish. Who's, who's done that in the past? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we need a uh, counselling session for that one. <laughs> uh, so yeah, as I said, I'm not a storage guy, so fortunately um, Jim is a storage guy, so any of the storage stuff, he's going to talk about that. I'm an automation and deployment guy, and uh, a user experience guy, I think. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, and you, you're also an MVP for AppV? I am. Yeah. I did want to admit that. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and why now? Why are we talking about PBS and MCS now? Because essentially, um, Excalibur brings MCS to Zenap. So, this PBS versus MCS discussion that has been happening in VDI forever is now. Uh, the same discussion that we're going to be having for ZenApp. Because, as you probably know, uh, in a way, there's going to be no such thing as ZenApp anymore, right? IMA's gone, and it's a, that's all binned. 
and uh, they're rolling ZenApp into Zen Desktop. Still, uh, ZenApp 6.5, what's the end of life? 2016 or something? Something like that, yeah. So ZenApp yeah. is going to be around for a while. Yeah. But uh, I'm looking forward to Excalibur because MCS, I think, makes life a lot easier. And I, I think maybe five years, what, 2016, I don't think we'll be talking about PVS. I think PVS. This is meant to be the conclusion, be not the opener, right? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. yeah, yeah. Fine. But when we turn <laughs> that when we turn that last Zenat box off, I think we're going to be turning that PVS box off as well. Yeah. Because I think everything is is being pushed down into the storage layer, and we can hopefully do away with the complexity of PVS. Mm. I'm not anti PVS, so I'll say that. But I think um, things are getting easier. So. Um, Essentially, we're going to be talking about deployment. Um, there is lots of ways to deploy VMs. The old drive switcheroo, next x next ghost. Um, <coughs> particularly, Citrix and VMware provide um, help in the terms of provisioning services, machine creation services, and link clones. And we'll try and talk about how you should best take advantage of these uh, technologies and uh, where you should use each technology. So, uh, sorry, just, just on the Citrix VMware stuff, I, so my role, I talk to customers, and there's definitely a misconception in what, uh, and I don't know where this comes from, I don't want to point the finger at Citrix or VMware, maybe it's just the industry in general. Right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a misconception with customers, particularly those customers who perhaps desktop virtualization is new to them, that desktop virtualization solves all of my problems. Magically, my application delivery problems have gone away. My patching stuff's gone away, and this, this is not the case. So I don't just create a VM and clone it and happy days. All that stuff I'm still doing in the physical world, I'm still, I'm still doing here. So when I'm talking to customers, it's, it's fighting this misconception piece as well. Yeah. So if we're going to go from physical to virtual, whether that's Zen up, Zen desktop, doesn't matter. We do need to find a way of, uh, of deploying those uh, images into your, into your centralized desktop location. You want an ISO and get next next finish? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but that's the easy part, I think. Yeah. The, the, there's all the other stuff that's got to go wrapped around that. And again, more misconceptions, things that people don't think about. What about all my apps, all my data and stuff? If I start mixing physical and virtual desktops, because I'm not going to get rid of my virtual desktops, physical desktops, uh, I've picked my data up, <laughs> I've stuck it in the data center, and now it's not where my laptop is, it's stuck over here in the data center. I've really got to think about all this other stuff. So I think the desktop piece is the easy part. The apps and the data, that's where the difficulty comes in. So when you're doing some kind of desktop centralization project, your very, very first choice <laughs> is to have a beer and get drunk first. <laughs> yeah. Or is that last? Yeah, no, well, no, you, you can write that down, guys. Jim Wells, CTP says, drink beer, all right? <laughs> um, <coughs> stateless versus persistent. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I mean by stateless versus um, persistent, and so we, we know we're all talking about the same thing, right? Um, <coughs> like this beer, you're going to like this metaphor. Like this beer, yeah, stateless means you can destroy it, and another one exactly the same will be along in a minute. <laughs> Persistent is something that you really care about, something that you have a one-to-one -one relationship that will stick around forever. Told you you like that metaphor. Took me ages. Um, I like it. Yeah. Um, so stateless means that essentially the OS is disposable, right? And uh, it doesn't matter what VM the user logs into, then um, they get the same experience. It, it, for, for them, it's essentially the same VM. We know it's different, but for them, it's essentially the same VM. So this is interesting when you come to ZenApp. So I have this conversation quite a lot with customers of ours. It's like, uh, is ZenApp stateless or persistent? Well, I would say usually uh, that depends on whether you're using PVS because of the amount of time to, to redeploy. So I consider ZenApp stateless when you're using PVS because there's, there's no data on it, no, no user data on any ZenApp servers, right guys? Yeah, no one's ever seen that at all. <laughs> but there should be no user data on any ZenApp servers. This, uh, again, I think coming back to misconceptions, 
talking to customers. What we're talking about here is stateless versus persistent from an administrative perspective. So us thinking about stateless and persistent. From a user perspective, this is very different. So I talk to a customer who maybe hasn't done desktop virtualization before, and you start talking about non-persistent desktops and persistent desktops, and their first thought is, what happens to my user data? Every time the user logs back on, Outlook's got to be reconfigured. Mm -hmm. So stateless versus persistent, non-persistent versus persistent. It's all different, all different layers here, and you've got to tackle these problems at different layers with yeah. different solutions. I am I'm deliberately mixing terms, right? Stateless versus persistent, because it should be stateless versus stateful or persistent versus non-persistent. But I tend to find that saying it this way makes it clearer in people's heads. So, um, <coughs> so we're going to have a look at PVS versus MCS versus <coughs> MDT, which is the mystery, mystery one, and where Aaron comes in. Um, MDT stands for Microsoft Deployment uh, Toolkit. So stateless, provisioning services, machine creation services or link clones. Persistent, full fat VMs or personal VDisk. I know personal VDisk has um, um, provisioning services or machine creation services along with it, but we'll ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll Any come to that call, just, just hold your horses. Anyone using PVD, got customers using PVD? Wow, Ooh. one, two, right. three, four, five, six. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll come and ask you questions in a little bit. Um, <coughs> there is a reason why I haven't put the top three technologies under persistent as well. Because you can do it, you, there, is, there is a button. Yeah, you can say use um, provisioning services and persist the data. Yeah, when you're deploying via MCS, you can pick the, the radio button that, uh, that says it, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, <coughs> so let's talk about MDT for a bit, which is very much your bit, Aaron. Yeah, so I think, I think coming back to the um PVS, MCS, and my, so my gold build, a lot of customers I've seen use PVS, MCS, link clones, whatever it is, as an excuse for not doing build automation. It doesn't replace build automation. It's still two parts. I've still got to create my, uh, my gold image. I still need that to be nice and open, clear, and somebody else can come along and understand exactly what's going on in there. Maybe I need to repeat that, creation that gold image. I've got test, dev, UAT in production, I want to version that somehow, and MCS, PVS isn't the way to do it. Uh, if I have a problem with that image, uh, maybe I need to rule out MCS, PVS in that stack to simplify troubleshooting. How am I going to rebuild that image, uh, especially say if it's PVS? Maybe I could go and copy the VDisk, it's just a uh, VHD, isn't it? So I could go and open that up and mount it, but I think you know, if I really want to know what's going on inside that machine, I've got to rebuild it from scratch. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm a big fan of MDT. Uh, and what we do, talk to a number of customers, good chunk of customers, who don't do any build automation. They don't have anything like Config Manager. They have been going next, next, finish. And uh, so for us, uh, MDT is an easy tool that we can pick up and drop into a customer environment and get up and running very quickly. I'll talk about the architecture in a second and why that is simple, yeah. but it's very, it's nice and portable. I've actually uh, been at some customers who have found <laughs> they've got a problem with their golden image because over time it's changed. It's like they've installed or added um, patches or applications to the golden image. And they last built their golden image two, three years ago. And now nobody knows what they did, literally. There's no, there's no documentation. Yeah, the guy that did it is gone. And I, but the 27th change broke the fifth change. How do I go, how do, how do I fix this? Um, well, I could either troubleshoot the image, which is what they end up doing mostly in more and more undocumented changes. Um, or they say, oh, sod this, this is horrible. Well, look, look at this horrible mess we're in. Uh, let's rebuild the golden image. And they look around and say, like, oh, <laughs> we're gonna have to do all of that work again. So I've seen that happen numerous times. One thing I have seen is uh, they've created that image manually. And then they use a tool like uh, AppSense Environment Manager to do all this computer level configuration stuff. So they've gone next, next, finish. Then, yep, we're good to go. We'll roll it out to pilot. And then, well, hang on, I've got some changes to do. I've even seen antivirus being deployed through Environment Manager. 
Now, my view, environment manager is a user environment management tool, not a computer management tool. So uh, they're doing, using these, t these the, the wrong tools in the wrong place to do the wrong thing. All this, uh, get that build right before we start deploying it. Um, <coughs> we actually have uh, an MDT deployment to show you. Live demo. We're actually going to deploy machines live on stage. I hope so. I've got to unplug this, uh, <laughs> this VGA cable and plug it in here. Yeah. So uh, yeah. everyone cross fingers. So just before you do that. Um, so hopefully we shall go from scratch to fully deployed while we're, while we're here and we can show, show off a couple of things. Um, <coughs> which means that periodically Aaron's going to jump in when something exciting is happening with the MDT and we have to swap the VGA cables. Now, I know what you're thinking. There's two screens and two computers. Doesn't work like that in here, apparently. We've got to, use, we've got to show the same thing on both screens. Um, <coughs> so essentially, Aaron will jump in and interrupt me when uh, exciting things in MDT happen. But I'm a bit forgetful, and I lose my train of thought sometimes. So I think Carl. You, your job, yeah, when Aaron interrupts me, is to remember what the fuck I was talking about. <laughs> All right? <laughs> and then we can get me back on track. That, that, that's your job. You've got pen, paper, you're all set. And uh, you haven't had any beer on, have you? I, not yet, but uh, <laughs> hopefully soon. So, um, give just a really quick bit of background. I'm going to kick this off. Um, who knows where it's going to finish by the time we get through the end of the session. Hopefully it does. I've got a little bit of a backup. We'll see what happens. So what I'm doing here is I'm using, uh, it's, it's, this is very much an academic exercise at the moment, but essentially it's a really big, long PowerShell script that does a few things. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a nice flow chart to look at that, but we're going to mix in things like um, vSphere, MDT, uh, Zen Desktop. We're going to deploy the image, stick it in uh, on top of, uh, in this case, Ilio. I haven't really tested with um, Something else. What's the one that VMware bought recently? I want to try that one. Versto. Versto, yeah, I want to give that one a go. Mm. Uh, create some VMs on those. Use a different cloning techno technology tool other than MCS. Create a, a, a thing, desktop group in uh, Zen Desktop. And the, whole, the entire process is, uh, is automated. So I've got, um, I've got a couple of VMs inside uh, my Ilio folder here. Uh, I have Zen Desktop, that is uh, nothing up my sleeve. Uh, and a long PowerShell script, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but what we will do is kick this off. So I'm just uh, authenticating to vCenter here. Okay, so it's going to go and do its thing. So at this point, uh, it's creating a VM, so a nice empty VM for me. Uh, I've got to pull some detail out of that VM uh, and then kick off a, an MDT task sequence. So that's going to go ahead and do its thing. While it's doing that, let's uh, look back over. In, in, in seamless fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so <coughs> um, there's been other people with long PowerShell uh, scripts doing sessions, uh, this Bry Forum. Carl Webster did a great, uh, great session on uh, on documenting your Zen App Farm with PowerShell or Zen Desktop Farm with PowerShell. Um, Carl, are your scripts available to the public to download? Are these guys here for free? For free? Yeah. They are. They are. CarlWebster.com. CarlWebster.com. Uh, Jeff Wooters did some uh, PowerShell stuff. He's not here in the room, but his stuff is that is that downloadable for free and available to everybody? Yeah. It, it is. Wow. That's Jeff Wilders. Don't know. There, there's a bit of a theme here, isn't there? Aaron, are your PowerShell scripts available for everybody to download <laughs> for free? <laughs> Bear in mind, you are at the biggest community desktop uh, conference, you know, in Europe. Uh, so, well, yeah. I'll say they're not ready. Um, uh, as I said earlier, this is a bit of an academic exercise, so uh, we'll, we'll see. Part of what I've been doing is been on company time, so that's uh, it's going to be, you know, it's a bit of a grey area, but... Work never finishes for me, so I might have been doing this on company time. I might have been doing this uh, while sitting on the couch next to my wife watching TV at the same time. So doing, doing this at all hours. So 
what I might do after Synergy is um, I'm going to pull out certain bits and pieces of it <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and make them available. <laughs> Good. Uh, so just a really quick architecture of MDT, why I like it so much. <coughs> because it is so simple. Basically, all it is is just a file share. That's really all I need. Um, uh, you know, that file share could be anything. It could be a bit of storage. It could be a Windows box, what, whatever you want, NAS box, anything. Um, uh, typically driven through a file called custom settings.in. So this just controls what happens during deployment or what happens when I boot a machine or what happens on that specific endpoint. So I might have some details around the endpoint and uh, uh, maybe set a static IP address or so on. And I might identify that endpoint um, by UUID, pull the UUID off the machine. And so my PowerShell script, I've created a VM. I'm pulling the UUID out of that VM, writing that to custom settings.e, and when the machine boots, I can see I've already set up all the automated deployment stuff for that machine. So I'm basically doing a zero touch deployment with uh, MDT. Um, WinP boot ISO, ISO, um, physical CD if I'm doing it to physical machines, or I can integrate with this uh, WDS. So if this was a, an actual sitting on a Windows box. WDS is Windows Deployment Services. Oh yeah, know. sorry. WDS for those who, Windows Deployment Services who, for those who don't know. Um, so I could boot across the network, but WDS requires Pixie, and if I'm doing PVS and Pixie on the same network, um, then I could uh, I could run into some issues here. Jim doesn't like Pixie. I fucking hate Pixie. <laughs> uh, you going to try to troubleshoot Pixie? It's like trying to do a jigsaw blindfolded. Yeah, it's terrifyingly bad. You prefer unicorns. Unicorns are better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, whatever my target endpoint yeah. is. I, I used to work for a deployment uh, tool set company uh, called Vision App. And I'd be on the phone, and my girlfriend would hear me talking about pixies and clouds. It's like, what the hell are you doing? But there you go. Um, so looking at this script is a bit of a flow chart as what it does. First off, write some PowerShell. You're real simple. Um, kick off the script. So uh, kicking off that script at the moment is a play button inside the, uh, the IC. That's, you know, I've got I've to do something manual. Um, but with a bit of effort, maybe I could create a web front end that says, uh, I want this type of machine, I want these applications on it, I want it on this box over here, I'm sitting on top of that storage, and that could just write some uh, arguments for pa that PowerShell script and, and kick it off. But with enough time, I could do all sorts of things. Uh, uh, create that new VM. The reason I'm creating a new VM is so that uh, I have a nice, clean environment. If I'm trying to do zero touch, and there's an OS already on the disk, then I'm going to have to, and I'm booting WinPE, I'm going to have to walk up on the console and make sure it boots off there manually. Uh, I connect to MDT. So MDT can be driven through PowerShell, and I can do all sorts of stuff. So I could automate creation of a PowerShell share, but in this instance, I can monitor the task sequence. So power, uh, MDT does some monitoring stuff. So as the task sequence is running, the endpoint reports back to MDT, and I can monitor that with PowerShell. So I get a percentage complete, for example. So as, as that counts, I can, I can see exactly what's going on. Uh, I boot that VM, monitor the Windows deployment. So as the task sequence is going, I can see the entire deployment finish or complete and then finish. I can see when that machine is uh, shut down. In this instance, I'm connecting to Atlantis Ilio, but this could be anything. So this could be any kind of storage solution, I think, that maybe has its own cloning uh, utility in it. In this instance, I'm connecting over SSH. So the through PowerShell SSH on that box. I'm going to do the Ilio fast clone. So I'm not using MCS here. I'm using Ilio. I've created the VM on Ilio. I'm then telling Ilio, fast clone that VM. So because I'm doing this at the storage layer, not anywhere above this, the storage is doing the cloning of the VM, so it should be really quick. So interestingly, um, there's two ways you could use this, right? You could, you could use this to automate the build of your PVS or MCS golden image, or you could deploy persistent VMs, right? So you can do it both ways. Anyone going to Synergy, come to my session, and I'll show you um, driving p uh, PVS with PowerShell and, and doing all that kind of stuff, so different, different kind of scenarios. Um, uh, so I, yeah, uh, really what I have is a whole heap of persistent 
VMs. And I'm, I've got to import those into the uh, vCenter inventory. Then I'm going to connect to Zen Desktop, create a desktop catalog with those uh, persistent VMs, create a desktop group that I can assign those VMs to, and I'm complete done. Uh, so, so what's what happening is, is from nothing, from, we've yes. got a whole deployed Zen Desktop group. Yeah. From zero to nothing, yes, hands off. Yeah. So uh, what's happening here now? The task sequence is running. So Windows is deploying on the, on the, uh, on the box. Uh, when something cool happens, yeah. I'll interrupt. All right, good. Um, so why shouldn't you use PBS or MCS for persistent desktops? Now, this isn't a stupid question. <laughs> I've seen this happen on customers quite a lot. All right, people use MCS and PBS for persistent desktops. Idiots. Um, well, maybe, but Citrix actually puts the button there. It says, you can do this, look. So you tend to find people who, who, uh, who maybe don't know so much about MCS or PBS saying, oh, look, I can do this, and, and click that button. So why shouldn't you do it? Well, maintenance. If you need to change something on your storage or your hypervisor, that may prove tricky. Growth of delta. So any delta file over time will reach the same size as the original goal of the image. Um, <coughs> not even just the data, it'll actually reach the same size as the disk. So my question that I had earlier was, does that have, does that have any impact on I.O.? So if I'm doing, doing non-persistent and I've got write cache and I reboot those VMs and delete the write cache, mm. this instance, that write cache never disappears. Does that have anything, any impact on I.O.? So it doesn't because within Windows itself, you still do the exact same amounts of reads and writes as you would do with a small or a large write cache. So it's just a capacity thing. But I could get my storage to do, um, I don't know, block level digit. Maybe. You could, you could. But you know, uh, what the point I'm making is that PBS and MCS is not a space saving tool. Yeah, which some people seem to think it is. Um, once you've deployed it, you have to use existing update methods, WSUS, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you still need to do this for non-persistent desktops. So I, I so saying before. I might be picking up my physical desktops, sticking them in the data center, but I can't forget about patch management, application deployment, and stuff like that. I've still got to do all that stuff. So yeah. you know, Citrix and Microsoft have done a lot of stuff around Config Manager to make it aware of non-persistent desktops. So I've still got to do it, but mm. you know, it's, I've still got to, I guess I've still got to get those apps in there, don't I? Um, yes, absolutely. So uh, interestingly, storage vMotion and MCS, you cannot storage vMotion and MCS virtual machine because uh, the VM is linked to the template and the template lives on the same bit of storage, it has to. So whenever you deploy MCS uh, virtual machines, what it does, it takes a copy of your golden image and puts a copy of that golden image on every single bit of storage associated with that, with that catalog. If you orphan a MCS machine from its golden image, it will break. So if you try and move it somewhere else. So that means that if you have a persistent VM based on MCS and you say, I would like to upgrade my storage, please. Well, either you have to destroy those VMs or you have to do it while the desktop is switched off. So, you know, overnight or whatever. It's not, not gonna be fun. Um, troubleshooting is harder. Um, it's, I mean, for instance, PBS, what you've done essentially is you've split out your reads and your writes. So your reads are coming from uh, your golden image. Say if you have a performance issue, and you're saying, well, I wonder if it's storage. So instead of just looking at storage, you're now looking at two bits of storage and your network and your PBS server. I'm just gonna flip this over yeah. real quick. So I'll just uh, seamless transition again. <laughs> Just to give you a bit of an idea of what's happening. Okay, so it's a deployment. Woohoo! Um, that bit's obviously the longest bit. I've got to install Windows, I've got to install my, pa uh, my applications, I've got to do patch management and so on. Uh, so that, that's going to take quite a bit of time. But in the background, uh, so what's happening here at the top of the screen, this little progress bar going across, is I'm monitoring the MDT deployment. I can see, you can see the step there, task sequence and progress. 
the dependencies, and if I go into this window, and here I can see dependencies and runtime. So I can monitor the entire stock as it, as it goes. Um, so we've talked about troubleshooting, see I didn't need you this time. Talk about troubleshooting. Uh, if you split your reads and your writes off, then it's more complicated. Um, <coughs> and resilience as well. If you need to make your environment resilient and you've got PVS, if anybody's ever tried to make it resilient and they've got PVS, it's, a, it's not the easiest job in the world. Um, <coughs> Delta files growing. You know, I said it would grow to the same size as the original disk. Why is that? Um, well, file deletion and file resizing. Essentially, what Windows does is it says, uh, it says to you, yes, I've deleted it, but in fact, that data is still there on disk. All it does is marks it as able to be overwritten. This is what blocks look like to storage when they're valid. This is what, what blocks look like to storage when they've been deleted. It's exactly the same. So storage has no way of knowing. Now, talked a bit yesterday in my other session about uh, VMware's new SE sparse file format. That sorts this problem out. But it's only available for View 5.2 on vSphere 5.1 at the moment. Um, there was also another tool called sdelete, which sorts this problem out from uh, system internals. But we won't go into that now. So does anybody know what's the difference between delete and shift delete? Well, one's a, one's a uh, change, change the folder, and one just marks the data as being overwritten. So there's no, no, there's no, no real way in, in Windows to actually delete stuff. So. Um, and if your recycle bin's small, then it will do a shift delete, right? This is too big to fit in your recycle bin. So this impacts user experience. So I think uh, you probably see this from recommendations from Citrix and VMware, turn your recycle bin off. But I've stuck all my desktops in the data center and I've said to users, hey, this is better than your physical desktop. If I start going ahead and doing something like this, then I've actually made that thing worse than my physical desktop. I, I hate changing the user experience. I hate uh, turning indexing off and all that crap that we're supposed to do. It's horrible. <coughs> um, PBS, this technology allows computers to be provisioned and reprovisioned in real time from a single shared disk image based on software streaming technology. Very cool stuff that Citrix bought from Ardents back in the day, uh, back in, importantly, back in the day when everything was physical. This is Ardents technologies from, is predates virtualization pretty much. Um, and that's kind of important to remember. So let's have a look at uh, PVS. Uh, oh, oh. Go, go back a slide. Yeah. So my first job was uh, at a technical college, and uh, we had these, the ugliest HP desktops you've ever seen. And uh, we were deploying Windows 3.1. The way we're doing it is those machines would boot uh, DOS and have a network client on it, and they'd connect to run uh, 3.1 across the network. So you're saying that I was using PVS back in 1993, four maybe? And, and you're going to call PVS desktop virtualization, and you heard it fir here first, guys. Aaron Parker invented video. <laughs> 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 um, uh, PVS architecture. Well, we've got SQL databases, license servers, consoles, bit of shared storage, AD, the actual provisioning servers, the infrastructure. There is a reasonable amount of infrastructure that comes along with provisioning services. We've all, all installed it. Uh, we've all troubleshot it. It's, it's kind of a bit of a beast. Um, uh, okay, go back. So if I, if I again, if I talk to a customer who has never done desktop virtualization before, do I lead with PVS? Ooh, I don't know. That's a tough, co tough conversation. Um, I think that's complex. There's a lot of stuff in that that can break. That doesn't mean that PVS is a bad thing and doesn't doesn't. You know, it's probably uh, doesn't give you a good result. Uh, I think if you if it's a customer who's never seen it before, uh, and you say you've got to have uh, PVS servers in there, you've got to have a database. They're going to have to provide high availability, so I might have to use Netscaler in there as well. Uh, what about my back end and um, what happens if it falls over and I've got to back up my database and do all this kind of stuff. Isn't there a recent Citrix blog post which shows you how to use Netscaler to make your Pixie service highly available? That's the, I think there is. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Full of unicorns. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is why I think we're trying, I think we are better off trying to do this at a storage layer 
instead of PVS. PVS, I think the sun, set, the sun is setting for PVS. If, we, if storage is getting better, there are more options. Versto, Ilio, uh, I think even EMC is doing, doing something around, I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. So if we can do all this with a storage layer, um, then that'll go away eventually. So there was a blog post, someone saying PVS is not going away. There was, yeah. And I, th I, th I can't remember who that was. He's not in the room, is he? <laughs> I think he, I think he's he's kidding himself. It yeah. is it is going. Do, do, do you think that's please let my job stay around? Blog <laughs> post. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, we're going to talk a little bit about right cache options. Um, <clears throat> so cache on local hard drive. That's what ninety percent of people do. Um, look at this. Cache on local hard device hard drive persisted. Persisted. Really? Why is that there? It should not be there. Caching device RAM. Now, <coughs> that's getting more and more common. So about 5% of people <laughs> do this. So this I, these 5% of people have very large uh, testicles. nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I've, 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 I've spoken to a customer of a very large environment, and they're doing uh, uh, cache to RAM. And I was, wow, that's, that's impressive. So caching to RAM is uh, more valid nowadays. So it involves a network driver. And it used to be that if you cached the RAM and you uh, overfilled your write cache, uh, it would still tell you that you are writing. You could write as much as you liked. You could copy gigs and gigs of ISO into it, and it would appear to be there. And what was happening is the network driver was telling, answering Windows with a commit when it actually hadn't committed the data. This in storage world is a very, very big no-no. Yeah. <laughs> And what was happening is that when you tried to go and retrieve that data, it turned out that, funnily enough, it wasn't there at all. And the driver had been lying to Windows the whole time. And uh, you blue screened and you lost your data. That used to be the case with cache and RAM. It is now a little safer, because now when you run out of RAM, you just freeze, so you don't actually lose data. That's better? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a little bit better. What's the user going to think? <laughs> <laughs> How do you explain that? Yeah, uh, you, you, we did cache in RAM for pre... No, that's not, that's not the story. Um, <coughs> so what's the next option? Uh, cache on server. Uh, lots of people do this and don't realize they're doing it. Um, because they do cache on hard drive, it fails, and it falls back to cache on server. And uh, I've actually said, no, no, we're definitely cache on the hard drive. I configured it that way. But they've got their D drive as a CD drive, right? And you can't put a write cache on a CD drive, and then it falls back to cache on server, and, and you're, in, you're in the ship, because all your I/O is now coming from that single PVS server, rather than from wherever you meant to put it, SAN or really or whatever. <coughs> and uh, last one, cache on server persisted. Oh my god, really? You're going <laughs> to put a write cache on your PVS server, and you're going to make it persistent? No, horrible, horrible. Stuart, take that out. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please, yeah. Um, I want to thank Ruben and Yaron, who, who were doing, uh, who were standing on the stage just before us. Uh, they allow me to use the uh, slide from State of the Union. So if you want to read the rest of this excellent white paper from them, go to uh, projectvrc.com. And we could see that when they did their survey, so 30% using PVS, 10% using MCS. So, so. Out of the two, PVS is winning sort of 75% of the time. Um, we did a CTPs versus Citrix Consulting session at Synergy last year. And uh, Citrix Consulting was sitting up on stage. And, they, they were, and I suggested that perhaps MCS might be a good idea. Uh, they, they laughed at me because Citrix Consulting are so hell-bent on using PVS. They think it's brilliant. Um, <coughs> More billable hours, yeah. <laughs> um, but there was, there was very few people out using MCS. And there is, there is a, a reasonably good reason why, why this is, right? So, <coughs> yeah. so um, MCS for virtual only. So PVS will do physical as well, obviously. MCS for virtual only. Uh, Citrix say it's for stateless and persistent. No, it's not. It's just for stateless. And it's nice and simple. So uh, uh, let me show you the architecture slide for, PV, uh, for MCS, and you can compare it to, to PVS. 
This is my architecture slide for MCS. Um, <coughs> if you've built Zen Desktop, you've already got MCS. Yeah, it doesn't require any extra databases, any extra anything. It just works. Um, <coughs> PVD, let's talk a bit about PVD. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carl, for that, uh, for that uh, contribution. He just went <laughs> um, RingCube uh, acquisition 2011 uh, enables user inst installed apps, makes everything persistent. So it's an add-on to PVS and MCS, and it's applied at boot. Yeah, if you've got 3,000 users, then you and a thousand concurrent, you're going to have to have 3,000 VMs up and running, because PVD is there. Yeah, it makes your writes, it makes your because it's attached to the VM, you have to have that particular VM along with PVD. Who put their hand up as doing PVD before? Yeah, how many, how many users? About 120. About, about 120? 120. 200. 200. Anybody else? Well, my code flow was trying to do 75, but it didn't quite work out. No, okay. But it doesn't, right. Okay. <laughs> Anyone using video in a box and enabling PVD? Anyone using video in a box? Hey. Hey, two. <laughs> what, with PVD? No. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, people think that, that PVD is a technology for adding the, this user drive to, to their logon, right? But it's not. It's applying it to the VM. It's very important. Um, they could do it at logon, but the trouble is, is that that conflict resolution that they do to make sure that um, you know, if you've installed Office in the golden image and in the PVD bit, that it all works, it takes time. And if you apply it at login, then that time is then applied at login and you will extend your login times massively. <coughs> so <coughs> whether they do find a way to make that quick and apply it at login, then it might become a useful technology. Uh, as it is, it's not particularly useful. Um, <coughs> I don't care about PVD architecture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, link clones, VMware View specific requires Composer. Persistent is more possible because you've got SD sparse files. You can requires do so. Composer, that's in Premier Edition. So I don't buy View Enterprise Edition. I have to buy the top tier. Yeah. So for View, I'm, if I want um, profile um, enhancement, you know, I want the. What's, it, what's, it, what's the VMware one called? Um, uh, if, I, if I want the equivalent to uh, UPM and I want. Composer, I have to buy Premier Edition. Mm. So, thumbs up to Citrix and actually including all that stuff in Enterprise. Uh, pros and cons of MCS versus PVS. So, you can use MCS uh, if you've got NFS storage or CSV and Hyper-V. So, this is from Citrix. You intend to deploy up to 2,500 desktops. I think that's a bit of a made-up number. Uh, I think MCS will probably work much larger. I think that's just what Citrix have tested. You'd, right. you'd take a, a pod-like architecture to yeah. any sort of enterprise Zen desktop deployment anyway, so I don't think you'd end up being limited by numbers yeah. if you've got the right architecture. You have sufficient IOPS available on shared storage. Ooh. So we'll go into that a lot, right? Because this is the reason why people don't deploy <laughs> MCS. All right. On shared storage, unlike PVS, which provides a RAM cache of disk blocks, the MCS, right? We'll, we will look into this a lot. In other environments, choose PVS. If you've got large, um, <laughs> your environment is IOPS constrained, whose environment isn't IOPS constrained in VDI. Uh, NFS is not an option. So <coughs> essentially, it's like only sometimes use, use MCS, and, and most of the case, use, use PVS. Uh, Dan <laughs> Fell, <laughs> I, lo I love this. Dan Feller did um, a decision tree, posted it up, uh, when to use PVS, when to use MCS, or see these ones here that are kind of like in between colors, when to use both. Okay. So <coughs> why, why does this exist? This should be simple, right? Just, oh, I need to deploy machines, I use block, that's fine, go. Yeah. That, that shouldn't exist. I don't see writing, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we'll have a look at PVD versus. So, if you want to do persistent desktops, why? And you think, okay, well, I can do persistent because I use 
I can create a provisioning services architecture, then I can create a PVD architecture, and then I can attach the PVD to boot, and oh, no, no, don't do any of that. Just, just do full fat VMs, right? So PVD, the only advantage that I can see is allows single instant manage, single image management for persistent VMs. So it's basically a management play, that's it. <coughs> full fat, well, everybody knows how to set up a full fat Windows and support a full fat Windows. Just not doing next, next finish, of course. <laughs> um, so let's talk about that IOPS thing, because when I spoke to Citrus Consulting, this was the, the thing that they used as a big hammer to say, you're, you're an idiot thinking MCS is good. All right. uh, Ken Bell, in a blog post, I know he's not here, it's just you, isn't it, Stuart? Yeah. <laughs> he's, in, he's next door. Uh, Jim, Jim, he's, uh, he's a little, just a little bit further back. Oh, hey, Ken. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> this is you. <laughs> Ken Bell says that uh, MCS is 1.6 times more demanding on IOPS. IOPS are very expensive. VDI, IOPS, we all know this story. Um, so do not use MCS for VDI or anything else because it costs you a massive amount of I.O. Um, but one point, hang on a minute. If VDI is 80% right and PVS is a read caching, how can it be 60% worse for MCS? How does that work? I'm not sure. So I decided to do some investigation. <coughs> so just to just talk about PVS. You have reads, which come from the golden image. You have writes, which go into the write cache. And you have rereads, which is rereading <laughs> stuff that's gone into the write cache. So, so your reads can come from one of two places, either from the golden image or from your write, write cache. And all your writes go into your write cache. So <coughs> um, what I did is I got 27 Windows 7 VMs. I set up a PVS architecture with uh, BDM. So and I put them each on, um, I, I work for Atlantis, so I put them each on a, an Atlantis earlier so I could get metrics out of them individually and show where each bit of I.O. was coming from and going to. Can I stop you right there? Yes. Let me just uh, switch over here because uh, something's happened. <laughs> Something good, I hope. Hey. So my task sequence is finished. Um, I know I've got a little error down there, but ignore that. There's nothing behind the curtain. Uh, so the VM has, has shut down. Now what I've done, so I've, I've got a completed VM sitting on storage. Just happens to be Ilio. I am uh, SSHing to Ilio, because the fast client stuff is a, um, is it right to say an SSH script or is it a shell script? Uh, shell bash script. Bash script, yeah. okay. Um, I'm running this bash script to do the fast clienting stuff. So uh, here, I've, if I've actually done this right, I'm only going to do f uh, five VMs, but this could be any number of VMs, whatever that storage is, uh, or whatever that's going to be capable of. So I could just clone my, clone my VM. Uh, so that's going to go and continue on. That might take a bit of time. So uh, by the time we come back, it'll be finished. Yep. But I do have a pre-recorded version of this, so we'll, we'll see the end of it. But that's uh, cloning the VMs, and the next step is then to import them into the vCenter inventory. Um, so back to the PVS architecture I built. So I split it all, all out so I can measure each bit. Thank you. Split it all so I can measure each bit. So I'm measuring IOPS underneath the PVS server itself. I'm measuring IOPS in the right cache and I'm measuring IOPS for BDM. Everybody knows what BDM is. You create an ISO, you beat up the ISO. It means you don't have to worry about Pixie. If you're going to do PVS, use BDM. It's very good. Um, and I'm also going to have a look at the network throughput, because obviously there's a network impact of PVS. And I can tell <coughs> these things I can tell. So I can tell uh, throughputs and IOPS from each other thing. Some of these things I don't care about, because I don't care about writes back into the PVS server. Yeah, I don't care about writes back into the uh, BDM environment. And I don't care about megabyte received, so I can not worry about some of this stuff. But I've measured all the rest. Um, 
we've got a graph. We're going to have uh, IOPS. We've, um, IOPS is up to 18,000 on the y-axis, time in seconds along the bottom. And we've got megabytes per second going up to 140. Now, can you compare throughput on the network to IOPS? Ooh, no, not really. So um, <coughs> one gigabyte network will give you 20,000 IOPS at 4K block size. Uh, is Windows 4K block size? Mostly. Yeah, this is the block size for uh, Windows, and uh, this is 4K blocks. Yeah, so almost all of the I.O. from Windows is at uh, 4K block size. This goes up to one meg here on the right-hand side. So <coughs> although almost all of the I.O. is at 4K, and that's why, you know, when we say it's all Windows is 4K block size, this is exactly the same, but this is throughput. So you see, in, in actual fact, that most of the data, most of the throughput is happening at the really high block sizes. Yeah? And your 4K, although it's creating most of the I.O., is not actually transferring as much data. So <coughs> I know that you can't take megabytes per second divided by 4K and you're going to get IOPS. It doesn't work because you've got variable block size in Windows. So I've made a, a stab at it, right? And I've said that about 8K, you divide by 8K and then you get it, right? And an actual fact, when I graph it all up, it, looks, it works out sort of. So you can, can compare it. Um, <coughs> So what happened? Uh, this is read from boot device management. It's zero. But we are booting from that ISO, so where's that lot coming in? In, in actual fact, this is on vSphere. So vSphere cached it, essentially. So that's kind of interesting to know. You don't need any read performance on your BDM drive if you're using vSphere. I didn't test with Zen Server or Hyper-V. Um, <coughs> yeah. VMware cache to BDM. This is megabytes sent per second. So you've got your boot off um, your ISO there. I have a confession to make. I have no idea what's going on here, why it's just fucking around. Yeah, you can see on the PVS screens it was just black and, and the boot process hadn't really started. Um, <coughs> I didn't have a massive amount of time, so troubleshooting PVS wasn't high on my list of stuff to do. So something's happening there, I don't know what it is. But this double peak, yeah, is absolutely classic Windows boot. Massive read peak, essentially. So this is the throughput per second from the PVS server. So we can see that we are getting a lot of read from that PVS RAM. This is the reads underneath the PVS server. So are we actually getting all of the reads from RAM on that PVS server? Or is it going back underneath itself to, to read from disk? So I gave PVS 8, gigabytes, eight, eight gig of RAM and it's about an 8 gig image. So I was actually getting all of my reads from the PVS RAM. So it's not going back under, under, underneath itself to storage. Yes, yeah, so it's doing a very, very good job of accelerating these reads and, and not touching your storage. This is write cache reads. So that, that's the, these are the rereads I'm talking about, yeah? And these, in fact, are very, very small. So, but there's some, but very small. So we don't have to worry too much about reads from your write cache. Um, <coughs> and this is write cache write. So this is what's actually going into your storage. Now, this is boot, remember. So boot is almost all read. So this is very classic for a Windows boot. Yeah, your two big read peaks, and then later on, a lower, a lower write peak. See that all the time. Well, I see that all the time because this is what I do, right? <coughs> so what's happening here? Essentially, the only thing that's going down to storage we use is this is this write cache right here. So <coughs> PVS is doing a very, very good job at boot. Um, PVS is all right then. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't throw it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Twenty-seven went. So this is our my MCS architecture. So we just need to do I upset to uh, a one storage uh, level. <coughs> so, oh, and let's go back to this one. I want to talk a little bit more about this. So 25 VMs, right? We got 140 meg per second. Uh, 128 megabyte per second is a theoretical limit of a one gig about link. So 25 VMs on boot is actually 
consuming more than uh, a gig link. So you know you, you definitely got to watch your network for for PVS. Um, <coughs> MCS, we're measuring IOPS at, at the storage level. Again, that classic double read peak and then a, a right lower down. We're getting about the same amount of I.O. Um, so as, a, as expected, right, all the reads and writes come in. So essentially, these 13,000 IOP read peak, now we've got to provide from storage rather than PVS providing it. Um, <coughs> so, but VDI is 80% right. Yeah, booting is not the normal state of a VM. Um, <clears throat> I did exactly the same test and took exactly the same metrics, but for steady state. And I'm much more interested in steady state because this is when people are actually working day to day, right? <clears throat> so for all of the metrics that we're talking about, yeah, I took the mean, the standard deviation, and the max. Why do I bother taking standard deviation? Standard deviation is crucial because it's a measure of how bursty that workload is. It's how high and how often peaks are being re reached. It's a much more important number than your, than your average, I think. So very important to keep. I'm not too bothered about the maxes. I'm much more bothered about the standard deviation. The higher that is, the more bursty and peaky your workload is and the, and the more you have to cope with that. So right into right cache. <coughs> for MCS and PVS, 128, 139, which is a 8% worse for MCS in writes. Standard deviation is almost exactly the same, so it's just equally bursty. And MAC is almost exactly the same, 400 and odd. So for writes, we're pretty much the same in steady state. We're saving 24 IOPS because PVS is, is, uh, is helping out with your read. <coughs> now, interestingly, so it's, it's, you see here that standard deviation is half of the average. That means it's not massively bursty. But in the network traffic here, the standard deviation is more than double that of the average, which means it's extremely peaky. Yeah? Very, very high, low, high, low, high, low. So that means you've got to, it's, it's harder to cope with as a... As a to provide the correct resources for it, yeah? Which was quite surprising that the, the network traffic was so bursty. And <coughs> so max in steady state, fine. Um, so if we look at it, is it is MCS much worse than PVS in steady state? No, it's not. Not at all. This this 1.6 hack in. <laughs> This 1.6 thing that Citrix said uh, instead of say is, is absolute rubbish. Do yeah. I really care? If I if I've um, I've got to do something about my storage anyway. So yep. tiered storage, uh, flash SSDs, whatever I'm doing, uh, deduping or looking at something versatile, really, whatever it is. At that point, do I care what what the difference between the two? If you've got advanced storage technologies, you, you can handle the, the, the <laughs> IOPS in a way, you're fine. But not everybody does, right? Now, <coughs> one interesting thing, that the benefit that PVS is giving you, whether and, and, and on boot is massive, right? Massive benefit. is because PVS is providing a static read cache. Yeah? Static read caches are by far the absolute easiest kind of cache to provide in from any storage solution. Yeah? Most of your SANs and your storage will have a static read cache. It's a piece of best to do, right? <coughs> Normal hard drives have got read caches on. So the, the amount that your PVS is saving you by the static read cache could quite easily be provided by your NAP or your EMC or your ILIO or whatever. So I would think that this massive amount of infrastructure that you need for PVS to provide yourself with a static read cache, you should maybe look at providing somewhere else and maybe using MCS as well, saving yourself the whole problem. So I think before we get too much further, as I said earlier, uh, I'm not a storage guy, so whenever I have this type of conversation with Jim, I think <laughs> it's fair to say um, that those, my mind is generally <laughs> blown at the end of those. I had no idea that, um, you know, if I start, may maybe small environments, mm. well, 
I guess it doesn't matter the size of the environment. Maybe small environments is actually worse because they've probably got some cheap storage in there, right? Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, but I didn't want to have to think about storage, and now I have to. <laughs> 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 All right, so um, my deployment is complete. You can see down the bottom here. For, uh, well, can you see down the bottom here? That took 31 minutes to deploy. So the bit you've kind of missed it through talking through here is, um, uh, if I can get this a bit bigger. So the deploy, the fast clone pieces has, uh, has finished. I've, I've then adding those, uh, essentially what are persistent VMs to the uh, vCenter or v, VM, vSphere storage inventory. And then connecting to PowerShell, I think it's fair to say the hardest part of doing this was Zen Desktop. So I'm using PowerShell to connect to Zen Desktop and it's just confusing. Thankfully there were some blog posts on uh, Citrix would help me. But the rest of it was really straightforward. The Zen Desktop stuff, because I've got to put in all metadata and all sorts of bits and pieces, took, took, uh, took a little bit more effort. Um, so this bit, if I create a desktop group, automated with uh, the signing persistent VMs to it. I think that bit ends up taking a bit of time as well. Mm. That, that it, might, it may be my environment, I don't know, but um, I think that was taking a bit of time. Uh, skip through those. And then creating the, uh, the, I keep mixing catalog and group. So catalog is the VMs. Group is actually the users this is assigned to and talking about boot schedules and when, uh, when those VMs are brought up and up and down. So I have finished um, uh, that deployment. For, so from zero to VMs, desktop, catalog, group, everything done in uh, 31 minutes. W would it be easier if they just call it machine group and user group? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I have my extra VMs inside uh, vCenter. Nothing uh, fancy there. I have... Um, my machine catalog and my assignment on my desktop group, and away I go. Um, would I so do this in production? I certainly do. I would do parts yeah. of it in production, yeah. um, especially the gold image piece. Maybe I'm not going to hit 100% automated gold image, but if I can do 80%, if I can hit 80%, you know, standard 80, 80, 20 rule, and maybe I've got a little bit a little bit of manual stuff left over, and then I've got a good chunk of that build that's, uh, uh, that is automated and repeatable, and what's left over hopefully is easy. How much probably, it's probably the developer's fault. If you wanted to do this on your own, how much does MT MDT cost for Microsoft? Uh, zero. Well, zero, but you have to have a Windows license. So everyone, everyone's got a Windows license. So, um, yeah, it, it's free to use, guys. It's there, it works, Microsoft provide it, use it to build your global images, it's great. Yeah, so if MDT's free, PowerShell's free, my time certainly isn't free. No. <laughs> um, Quite cheap, though. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> cheap. yeah, actually, I outsource myself to yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, overseas yeah. somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, if I can, as I say, if I can get good parts of this done, automated, uh, then I, thi I think that uh, I've achieved something. But there has been a lot of hours that have, that have gone into in to do that. So, <coughs> um, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm not, I, not, I don't have any more graphs for you or, or tables of numbers for you. Um, so I think all that's left really is the is is conclusion. I'm waiting on you again. Um, <coughs> so, unless you have a very specific need, I wouldn't use PVS, MCS, and PVD for a persistent VM. Yeah, if you've got people talking about it, say, don't you think that full fat VMs is probably going to be easier? And it will be easier, and you will thank yourself and for it later. So I'm, I'm doing a review for a customer at the moment around their entire EUC environment, and they're doing they're using MCS for uh, persistent VMs. Uh, and the output of this is going to be a report to management saying, you know, what's good and bad about their environment, and that's going to go down in, in red. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, if all your Zen app servers will be virtual in Excalibur, 
which, let's face it, they're going to be. Um, MCS is more than valid for deployment. In fact, it would be my first choice 90% of the time. And also, whatever you're doing, whether it's PBS or MCS, automate the build of your gold image. So I just want to pull out one thing. And this, I've said the MCS is very good. I just want to pull out one thing. The biggest problem with MCS is the fact that it copies its gold image to every single bit of storage. It's a massive pain. If, um, <coughs> if you have some kind of advanced storage solution for VDI, then your cost per gig is generally going to be high. If you have multiple images, it's going to copy them all over your environment. And it's going to cost you a lot of money. Apart from that, I like MCS very much. Um, <coughs> so, any questions? Uh, wow. Of course. <laughs> Who else? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we got one over here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so somebody sensible stuff's <laughs> just over here. Sean, what would you like to ask? No, 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 over right. here first. Okay, Ro I said sensible, Roland. Come on, <laughs> come on. So, so Roland's saying if you if you're using MCS and you've got um, many many images. Aren't, can't you use some kind of DGP technology to reduce down the, the size of that? Yes, you absolutely can. There isn't many flash or SSD vendors that have DGP. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to be careful here because I, I don't want to talk about Atlantis too much. So I'm <laughs> just, um, I'll answer that afterwards. How's that, Roland? I can talk about it. You can do DGP and Ilya. How's that? <laughs> Sean. <laughs> I'm never afraid of you're going to heckle me, Sean, because you always say such useful stuff. Um, is there any, anybody else who's got any, any questions about the data or about the testing or about how I did it? Or no? Anyone doing oh. persistent VMs with the MCS? So, it, uh, the, the main use case that benefits the MCS is uh, authentication. Yes. So, Ken, if you've got EMC storage, yeah, and uh, simply say NFS is best for MCS, are you happy with MCS on EMC? Use an FC. Are you happy using MCS on Fiber Channel? Depends on the hypervisor. Depends on the hypervisor. What hypervisor would you recommend? Ken Bell from <laughs> Citrix. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not Hyper-V then, is it? <laughs> Mark Templeton recommends Hyper-V, doesn't he? <laughs> on stage at Synergy, yeah. Um, okay, depends on the hypervisor, but it, you're happy with it working, it's supported? Yes. Anybody else? Yeah, I, d I, didn't, I didn't talk about, so in, on the Ilio piece, uh, after the, those machines have been cloned, they are basically a clone of the original uh, VM. Um, kind of, I guess, out of time here to sort of talk, uh, demonstrate. There, there it, is a way to uniquify those images. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's a obviously you know an Atlantis agent in there, and that will, and that will do the uniquifying of it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Good. Thank you very much for your time, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it.